Hello, you with the Ideas Factory, and I'm Nagma. Joining me is Professor Harsh Pand. Let's have a quick look first at the big stories this week around the world. Of course, the biggest story is coming out of Afghanistan, as there has been a suicide bombing in Kabul, just outside the airport, as thousands of people waiting outside the airport to be evacuated in which scores of civilians died and 13 US soldiers which has been haunting the American presidency. Uh, it of course followed a retaliation, a retribution and there were we saw drone strikes which targeted the Islamic State targets uh, but uh, thousands of people still await evacuation as the airlift deadline or the airlift window is narrowing uh, as the deadline approaches of evacuation 31st August, the deadline that has been given by the Taliban. So we'll have a look at what is going to happen there. The, uh, another big story is uh, US Vice President Kamala Harris visiting the Southeast Asian nations. What does it really say about Biden's Southeast America, Southeast Asia policy and uh, the Quad countries of the navies have been engaged in the exercises uh, in the Pacific. So we will have a look at all of these. Um, Hush, let's begin with Afghanistan, which of course is the biggest story worldwide and a lot has been happening in Afghanistan in this past week too. First of all, the death of 13 U.S. soldiers. It has been America, uh, haunting the American presidency, and this probably has tested Biden. This catastrophe has tested, by, tested Biden like never before. Uh, when he addressed the nation from the White House, he bowed his head and promised a retribution, which we saw in the form of drone strikes targeting the Islamic State targets. But at the same time, this clearly has diminished his standing uh, within America, at home, and America's stature worldwide. So the big question is, can we call it as a watershed moment? You know, that will be remembered forever for formalizing the end of, uh, you know, the long fraying Pax Americana, as many are calling it, that this is probably the end of Pax Americana. Uh, yes, Nagmai, this is, I think, it has been an incredible few past few days uh, for the U.S., for Afghanistan uh, and for you know for the region and for the world in in more ways than one, uh, and uh, you know you know this idea that uh, of course Pax Americana is facing its end in Kabul uh, may or may not happen. We will have to wait and watch for that. But I think it certainly uh, marks a line, uh, draws a line under that uh, you know uh, and under a very influential period of of America's power and glory, and the way America is now withdrawing. Uh, has already cast and will continue to cast a long shadow of its uh, on its other foreign policy priorities. That's without any doubt. And uh, you know, uh, I think uh, everywhere you see uh, nations are recalibrating. Nations are looking at uh, their options very, very carefully. Uh, and as Afghanistan and as the deadline, as you mentioned, of August 31 uh, comes into play, uh, everyone is waiting and watching. Almost that has become the buzzword: wait and watch. Uh, as to what the Taliban will be up to. But I think what has happened to Mr. Biden and his presidency is perhaps, uh, you know, at, at this particular point, the biggest story, because at the end of the day, everyone knew that the withdrawal was coming. But the symbolic process of withdrawal uh, certainly has made Mr. Biden very, very vulnerable politically. Not that he had any ambitions. You know, you, you would recall that he had said that he is happy to be a one time president. But I think even one time presidents need some honeymoon period. This is happening uh, within six months of his being in office. This is happening at, at a time when there are questions being asked about his uh, ability to handle crises of this magnitude. And I think there is a pushback within the American polity uh, against Mr. Biden that will have implications for his broader agenda. You know, if you look at his broader agenda of, of domestic uh, uh, reconfiguration of domestic revival of the American economy, reaching out to uh, partners in the Pacific, China, all, all of these questions today hang in the balance. And I think the death of 13 US soldiers will certainly haunt Mr. Biden for a very, very long time, even after he's out of the office, because I think that is now the larger coda around which uh, uh, you know a lot will be written uh, and everything will be measured against. And so he was quick. He was quick to say he will um, hunt down the, uh, you know, killers. And there have been uh, some bombings. 
but you know it, it doesn't do anything to at this particular point to enhance his stature it doesn't do anything to revive the credibility of american deterrence because at the end of the day america is still you know in the same position trying to disentangle uh, and trying to use intellectual and verbal gymnastics to make this distinction between good and bad terrorists how they have to negotiate with the taliban uh, now that the taliban have become suddenly the moderates uh, and isis khurasan is the is the bad guy and that has to be tackled with the help of these uh, of the taliban so i think a lot uh, is just getting more and more entangled and the more uh, you know they they try to uh, push against uh, and use military force against Taliban and you know against the actors on in the ground as they have this some of these last few hours to evacuate i think american credibility is certainly being questioned uh, it can you know that you know as we as we discussed last time there is no end game in in international politics it will certainly revive or it can be revived but i think for mr biden for american uh, for biden administration this is going to be a pivotal moment whether they can resurrect themselves from this catastrophe i think everyone would be watching out for that absolutely the big question is can they resurrect from this catastrophe but at the same time what does it really mean for china uh, you know it, uh, the american if we say that uh, it's kind of it formalizes the end of pax americana and if uh, what is it looking like right now and it just kind of leaves the field open for china oh yes i think china is is all out i think it's making uh, some you know it's it's reiterating Uh, some of the points uh, that it it had been making now for the past few years that uh, chinese model is more efficient uh, the chinese are better at uh, at managing uh, their periphery their regions uh, that american uh, that there is a fundamental dysfunctionality in america uh, which does not allow america to make decisions which are strategic in nature and therefore everyone should uh, the future is with with china and i think that's a narrative uh, that you know that as we have discussed in the past it has it has been through its ebb and flow and and we, we know that sometimes countries do buy into that narrative but at this particular point when mr biden looks so vulnerable when america looks so uh, uh, divided and frayed in managing even the withdrawal from Af- afghanistan yes. i think that gives that space to china to make a case to the wider world that look we what we what we have been telling you we have, we have been proven right once again that here is a withdrawal that is hap- that should have happened uh, that everyone expected to happen and even that couldn't be managed so i think the sheer incompetence at the heart of american um, uh, at biden administration is is raising a lot of questions and china will be uh, you know a beneficiary again i do, you know it, it's difficult to say whether this is going to be a long term trend or whether china can benefit over the long term by what is happening in afghanistan but i think certainly in the short to medium term uh, china will sharp this, this sharpens the narrative that china has been pushing in global politics and many of the countries that for a long time would have ignored this narrative would look at what is happening in afghanistan would look at mr biden's uh, almost uh, you know paralyzed decision making in 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 washington and would say well you know china is uh, ch- ch- there are some aspects of china's claims that look right and therefore we have to reconsider what we think of america and what we think of uh, america's credibility absolutely while america is frayed and the decision making looks um, or appears crippled in washington uh, you know this uh, the down and out america it gives boost to the international jihadi movement doesn't it because again america is uh, distinguishing between the the moderate taliban the taliban who are now we projected as moderates and who are supposedly helping america in evacuation of the americans while the isis or the is khurasan is attacking the americans and the rest of the civilians you know this is definitely is going to embolden the other jihadi groups or the other violent groups and in in taliban's emirate the al qaeda or the remnants of um, islamic state and the pakistani terror groups are likely to uh, find the sanctuaries so worldwide this is going to revive or give a boost to global terror i don't think there is any doubt nagma i think you know that the, the 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 way the narrative is shifting the way the narrative has evolved just in the last few weeks it's incredible that america today is in a position is not even in a position to evacuate its own citizens uh, from afghanistan without the help or without relying on some of the most violent terrorist terror groups uh, that operate in the world and look at the irony here you know that this 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 distinction that oh we are you know the, the 
ISIS Khurasan is, is, is are these bad guys, and uh, Mr. Mr. Biden has not once mentioned Taliban in his press conferences. He keeps on insisting that, uh, or at least uh, the the way he is presenting, that Taliban are going to be a very important partner. In fact, the irony of ironies now is that uh, you have a Biden administration saying that. Uh, that Taliban would be used uh, and Taliban can be partners in counterterrorism. So that is, you know, one of the most uh, incredible statements coming out from uh, from from Washington. But I think what is also interesting is that there, you know, if if you if you know the history of ISIS Khurasan, you know uh, that you know this is this is not the uh, ISIS of uh, of Iraq and uh, which which emerged out of the chaos in Iraq and Syria. There are certainly elements there, but there have always been this link with the Haqqani network. There have always been this links with certain sections of the Taliban, and that is that is out in the open. No, you know, you don't actually have to be a great researcher to find that out. Yeah. Now, to make that case, now what the what what Mr. Biden seems to be saying is that look, uh, we we need to rely on Taliban to fight these guys. It's incredible because uh, Haqqani network was uh, and the leader of the Haqqani network was given uh, the authority or was in charge of the security of the airport where the bombings took place by ISIS Khurasan, which supposedly by ISIS Khurasan. So I think the, the idea that you are living in a world where these uh, actors can be looked at in silos, where these actors are, are to be treated differently, uh, you know, you would have thought that these are the lessons America would have learned long back, but clearly not. And this is what is going to come back to haunt not only America, but I think South Asia, the region uh, and the wider international community. Yes, and America is making this distinction between Taliban and Al Qaeda at, at a time when there has been a recent UNSC report which says that Taliban and Al Qaeda remain closely aligned and cooperate through the Haqqani network, which is the front of, of uh, the Pakistani intelligence. Uh, Hush, there are a couple of questions which our audience, which our viewers have sent us before I move on. These are all related to the Afghanistan. So let's just take a few here. Hush Shah has asked that the hasty withdrawal of US has questioned its credit as a reliable partner. How will this reflect on the quad grouping wherein all the nations, India, US, Australia and Japan have been on the forefront for rules based international order? I think that is, you know, that is a wider uh, question in front of American foreign policy today, because as they uh, want to focus more and more on China, what they've done in Afghanistan, and how they have done it in Afghanistan mm -hmm. is going to cast a long shadow over a lot of these uh, partnerships and a lot of these engagements. Now, uh, you know, in in some ways, the logic of the quad is sui generis. You know, it, it is it is uh, that it is not simply about America. It is also about how uh, how middle powers like India, Japan, and Australia uh, have been pushing the narrative. So I think a lot of it will remain uh, because uh, you know these countries do want to stand up to China do want to stand up for a rule ba rules based order and they have a, a broader consensus amongst themselves. So I don't think there is a danger that uh, you know that partnerships like war or other trilateral partnerships where America is engaged would dissipate. The question is whether other countries can rely on the US or mm -hmm. will, will find US assurances as credible as they were finding it or, or, or as they thought they would find it uh, before uh, uh, this, this chaotic withdrawal. And I think it, it would require a certain kind of leadership in Washington. It would require a certain kind of posturing from, from Washington to convince uh, America's partners, to commit, convince America's allies that they are in it for a long haul. Because this uh, Afghanistan fiasco uh, has certainly damaged that aspect of, of uh, you know, America, uh, America's credibility. But I think there is yeah. another interesting element that, that, that can be pointed out, that you always have uh, you know, other partners that are middle powers that will that, that want to deal with America may find that this is a good time to tap into America because America after this would be keener to position itself uh, as a strategic partner for many countries. And therefore, this might become a more opportune moment for some of these countries to push the US in directions that they want rather than uh, America pushing these countries in directions uh, where America wants. Uh, that's a very interesting point. We'll see how these countries act. Uh, you know, there are many more questions which probably I'll take later because I will mean, be talking about Quad uh, and the nations uh, in Southeast Asia. Then uh, you know that U.S. Vice President Kamala Harris has been on a visit of Southeast Asian countries. Uh, 
so uh, you know a very quick uh, analysis on what uh, really does it indicate about Biden's Southeast Asia policy. There has been criticism that it is kind of directionless, even though we can see that there has been an outreach or at least a, uh, an effort which looks like an outreach or a charm uh, offensive, diplomatic charm offensive. But uh, is it closer to what Trump was already doing or is it going back to the Obama administration track? Uh, there, there were obvious rebuke of China's assertiveness, uh, which was not surprising. And uh, it's still uh, there have been many commentators saying that it lacks a clear roadmap. How do you look at it? Well, this is a start. I think uh, there was a criticism uh, in the first few months in office of Mr. Biden that you know he has not sufficiently focused on Southeast Asia, and uh, you know often you you hear countries talking about ASEAN centrality in their Indo-Pacific strategy. So it's very important for uh, for major powers to bring ASEAN into the discussion, and I think this was uh, you, you, a few weeks back. It was the uh, Secretary of Defense Austin Lloyd visiting uh, these countries, and now mm -hmm. it was. Uh, the, the, the vice president. And I think that the indication there being that ASEAN and, and uh, Southeast Asia is still very much uh, focused for, for the Biden administration and that uh, investment is being made, diplomatic capital is being spent. Uh, the unfortunate part, of course, was that uh, Kamala Harris, a lot of the questions she got during her visit were about Afghanistan because Afghanistan again has had cast a shadow over what, what she was doing. But I think her reaching out to two critical anchors like uh, Singapore and Vietnam uh, is an indication that uh, more or less Biden administration has taken the same route as uh, Trump administration had taken. There is, of course, uh, some difference in the way of articulation. There is greater uh, articulation of uh, joint uh, uh, you know, discussions on climate change, on health, on, on um, you know, public goods. Uh, and uh, China, while China is being rebuked, China is being talked about uh, the way uh, Perhaps the former Secretary of State Pompeo and, and President Trump uh, was putting China at the heart of this discussion, perhaps is being rectified to a certain extent. But you cannot get away with the fact that ultimately this is all about China and the engagement with Vietnam in particular points to this interesting discussion. And also ironical that at a time when there was a lot of uh, uh, commentary that America's withdrawal from Afghanistan looks like America's withdrawal from Saigon from um, from Vietnam. I think now uh, you know you had Kamala Harris visiting Vietnam at the same at the same time, and I think what it also tells you again that uh, you know international politics evolves in different ways. Uh, Vietnam and America uh, strong foes at one point today are coming together to reshape the regional security architecture vis-a-vis -vis China. So again, very interesting stuff here, which which I think tells you a certain story about how how a continuously evolving. Uh, international politics gives you surprises and another uh, another issue that really riles China is, of course, the Quad countries coming together or the Quad, the concept of Quad itself. Um, now, the Quad navies have been engaged in the Malabar exercise in the Pacific. Also, uh, if we look at, um, I mean, from India's perspective, perspective, why it matters to India and the significance of these exercises right now. Well, I think what is what is interesting is that India, uh, for the last few weeks, and I think it will continue over, over the next uh, one and a half months. In fact, Indian Navy is, is deployed in the Pacific, is is going uh, and and doing a lot of military exercises with a number of countries in in East and Southeast Asia, and of course, quadrilateral exercises, the Malabar exercises came in between. Now, these exercises, of course, as you know, have been very, very important and very controversial at one point because they were seen, uh, you know, China took a strong exception to them. But now they've become they've become very they've been normalized uh, and uh, and they are seen as part of this larger idea that port countries are coming together uh, and doing uh, more much, uh, you know, engaging with each other at, at a military level that was not possible before. Uh, but I think it is largely also about like minded countries trying to make sure that uh, rules of the game are followed in a part of the world which is becoming which is at the center of global discussions which is at the center of global economy and politics and so for india australia japan and the us to converge on uh, on naval on, on maritime issues and to bring their navies together to work on these issues is a very important sign uh, of things to come and i think uh, this is something that i think uh, will continuously evolve again uh, and uh, we will see it going from strength to strength because that is where the four nations interests lie at this at this particular juncture at a time of great strategic flux in the region okay just a couple of more questions we have time for that uh you know uh, 
Anand Sangameshwaran has asked, it's his concern, uh, whether the Panchi resistance, you know, how strong is it? And uh, will it really receive any support in any form, intelligence-wise or otherwise, from India or the inter Well, at, again, at this point, it's very difficult to say, uh, you know, um, uh, what might happen because we have seen Ahmed Shah Masood's son uh, Ahmed Masood, for example, openly asking the Western countries for help. Uh, and we have also seen reports that uh, there are negotiations going on. And in fact, Taliban had claimed that, uh, you know, they, they might be able to resolve uh, the Panchi resistance through negotiations. But I think the fundamental aspect where Panchi is going to play a very important role is that uh, it, it will always strive for autonomy from the Taliban. And I think that's where a fundamental fault line in Afghanistan lies, and it will continue to reverberate in, in, in Taliban, in, in Afghan politics. Whatever the configuration of government uh, comes out in Afghanistan after after uh, 31st of August, which the Taliban said is the, is, is, is the time that when they will start talking about, officially start talking about government formation. So I think whatever happens after that, Panchi will always, uh, that valley or, or people there will always make a case to the rest of the world that they will stand up to the to, to to Taliban and they will not give in. So so either they are included in the government in, in the government as an equal or they will continue to resist uh, Taliban's uh, overtures. So I think that is one of that is going to play out over the long term in Afghanistan. And uh, I am pretty sure that there'll be some support from uh, from uh, various quarters. We, for example, we have seen uh, US um, senators, uh, several US senators calling out President Biden uh, to declare uh, Panchir as an, uh, you know, as an autonomous entity and to help uh, Panchir uh, uh, with material support. Now, I don't know. I don't think that is likely to happen. But certainly, I think the voices, the stronger the resistance in Panchir uh, and the, uh, you know, and, and, and the pushback from the Taliban, I think the stronger the voices for support for Panchir uh, will continue to grow. Uh, all right. I don't think we have much time, but there is this uh, obvious concern which a lot of viewers have also written about of what should India's take be as far as Taliban is concerned. Uh, should India take Taliban's recent outreach towards it positively with concerns because we've seen how China has been very quick in recognizing the Taliban and holding a meeting with them. Uh, what should India's approach be? Well, I think at this point there is no, you know, uh, there is no harm in waiting for a few more days and seeing yeah. which way Taliban uh, go. So perhaps next week we'll have uh, more to say on this because we will know yeah. more uh, as to what Taliban have done uh, over, the, over the next few over the next week, uh, because then it will be clear which direction they want to go. At this point, they are saying a lot of things to a lot of people, to a lot of nations, and everyone seems to be in a position of waiting and watching. We have seen these statements yes. from Beijing, from Moscow, uh, and uh, even from Central Asia. So I think there is, uh, you know, there is uh, actually very little to talk about. But I think certainly by by the end of next week, we will know uh, uh, the direction and we will know uh, how Taliban uh, want to govern Afghanistan. If at all, they have a governance agenda. All right. Absolutely. Thank you so much, Harsh, for that analysis. Uh, we have time for uh, this much on this episode of the Ideas Factory, but we will uh, keep our focus on Afghanistan and all that is happening there as thousands of people still wait for evacuation as the airlift window narrows down before the 31st August deadline. So a, a lot of criticism uh, against the Biden administration in America. So he, he's facing a difficult time domestically, as well as the Statute of America worldwide has uh, diminished by what has happened in Afghanistan, the withdrawal and then followed, uh, you know, the attack on the U.S. soldiers and 13 U.S. soldiers actually dying there. So we will keep our focus on Afghanistan in the coming episodes, too. Thank you for being with us.